Well, I'll tell you, we have been amazed to see what God has done in the ministry of Casting Crowns. We're even more amazed to see what God is doing in our student ministry. I've been a youth pastor for about 13 years and been writing songs for a long time. And there's one thing I would want you to know about us before we, before we go tonight is that I came so, so close to never being a youth pastor. So close to, to never even thinking about writing a song. Because I have spent almost all of my life scared. It's as though Satan had these little buttons in the back of my head and he could hit them anytime he wanted. And it seems like any time that God was ever calling me to do something, first of all, when God leads you to, to do something, it always seems like it's, it's out here somewhere, you know? And right about the time I'm fired up enough to jump, Satan hits one of those buttons and reminds me, here's a million reasons why you're not good enough to do that. We've all got our buttons, don't we? Some of mine are, are a little different. One of mine is called dyslexia. When I, I don't read real good, basically. Uh, scientifically, somewhere between the page and my brain telling me what the page says, there's kind of a, and I lose my spot, okay? Uh, and I also, uh, when I was a little kid, I got tested for ADD, and I passed. <laughs> Thank you. Only hundred I ever got on a test in school. I was like, yeah. Mom was like, no. <laughs> you know, it was pretty quick to understand. I can understand dyslexia can't read. That, that's pretty simple. But ADD, they're explaining it to me, but I really wasn't listening. <laughs> so I'm still not exactly sure what it is. I just know what they abbreviate it for so we can get on to something else. Otherwise, I'll be up here going, yeah, I got attention deaf. Hey. <laughs> Something shiny over there. Yeah. So, uh, so I got tested right about before third grade, and, and I was a little kid, but I could pick up on stuff, you know, you know, you know I wasn't dense in every area, you know, and um, they were testing me. I think the funniest thing about that day was the length of time it took them to explain to me what ADD was. <laughs> okay, so run with me for a minute, okay? She, she gives me a test that tells her I'm not listening. <laughs> All through that hour-long discussion, I'm thinking, why are we still talking? You know? <laughs> I mean, I've already counted the ceiling tiles. <laughs> I've got, like, Brady Bunch episodes going through my head. Brady Bunch was a show. It's a long... Okay. So... Yeah. Okay, so, um... I... Uh, <laughs> see, just then. Whew, I'm like, I was talking about something. Um, so when I was coming up, it was really tough. And I can joke about it now, and it's so good for me to be able to do that. Because I was 21 years old before I ever said the word dyslexia. Because I was about this big. And Satan made sure any time I tried to even think about doing anything bigger than this, he would remind me one more time, you step out and I'll show them who you really are. Because what I'm learning is once Satan tells you you have a problem, the next thing he tells you is that you're the only one with that problem. And it didn't help for me to go to church because when I went to church when I was a kid, somehow, and I don't know exactly how, we were so blessed, but we were a part of the perfect church. <laughs> Nobody sinned at my church. I mean, they were all sick. Because, I mean, you go to prayer time and it's like hearts and lungs and brains and kidneys. But there, there were no marriages being prayed for. No one had unforgiveness in their heart. No one lusted after stuff or, or coveted. No one was bitter. And I just figured out pretty early, I'm messed up. Because if there's one place in the world you ought to be able to tell someone you need help, it'd be the body of Christ, right? So... That's a whole other song. So I learned pretty early to be quiet. And it took me a little while to figure out, you guys are messed up too. <laughs> so deal with that. 
And, and on top of this, Satan just stripped the word right out of my hands because I, I learned pretty early. I didn't take my Bible to church because if I ever took it to Sunday school, they made you read. You know, you remember that? The little room with the rainbows on the wall and little wooden chairs. And they'd make you read verses in the prayer like an hour because the teacher didn't study your lesson. You remember what I'm talking about. We're so on to you. We're so on to you. I kind of understand now because I'm thinking, you know, that she's up there thinking, I got 45 minutes with you, little beast. Turn to Leviticus. <laughs> I will have control. So, and I learned, you know, it's to start, I did a little thing where I would like count the people because they always go around the circle, you know, and I go one, two, three, four, five, and I go down to the fifth verse and I just start rehearsal <laughs> in my head. Just read it, read it, read it, read it, read it. Every time, man, right over here, some kid would go to the bathroom, throw the whole circle off. <laughs> Yeah. And I, I figure out pretty soon, you know, I think that kid was dyslexic. He was just smarter than me. <laughs> I'm sitting here counting the people. One, two. He just goes to the bathroom. Man. So I stopped taking my Bible. My, my Bible stayed on the remembrance table on the front of the church because I was always losing it. And uh, I never got to 2 Corinthians 12. Let me tell you something. When I was in middle school, I sure could have used 2 Corinthians 12. Because in 2 Corinthians 12, there's a guy named Paul. Heard of him? Yes. Paul starts telling the story of the fact that he had buttons in the back of his head too. He said, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh. A messenger of Satan to torment me. And for three times, I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Paul took a day off from starting churches and writing the New Testament. He took a day off to focus on himself. And all I could think was, God, if I, man, if I, if I was just younger, or, or God, if I, if I just had a degree like him, or if I could just sing like her, or if I was just, taller or, or, or faster or thinner or, or bigger. And he had all these reasons why God could use him if he was just somebody else. And that was me. I just assumed other people God could use so much better than me. And when I, when I was in college, guys started call, I'm not wandering off the stage, by the way. You think ADD guys just walking off and going to sing. You there? If you're sitting next to someone with ADD, here's what they're doing a lot. What'd he say? <laughs> Come back to us. So when I was about 20, God started calling me to ministry, and that totally freaked me out. I mean, I, I've spent a lot of energy staying off of one of these stage type things where all the people are facing me. And uh, for the sake of the story, I try to remember what exactly went through my head the day I jumped, but I just jumped. I think it may have been the ADD because God was calling me to something and Satan was probably going, ah, let me reach for this. And I was gone. Ah, just off. And in one week's time, I moved out of the house, moved out of the state. I got married and I started ministry school in Florida. <laughs> In about a week's time. It's as though God knew I was listening for a second. He just dumped it all on me there. And because I sang with my dad in church, I thought, well, maybe that's the ministry because I, you know, I didn't know what else I would do. And since I sang sometimes, I thought, well, I'll just major in music. So I'm down there and I'm in my first day of school. I'm signed up. I'm in orientation class before I remember something. I don't read music. <laughs> yeah. It was a long day. <laughs> Harsh day. I, uh, they load us all into this uh, music hall, music suite thing, right? And uh, so we're, here we are, uh, about 40 uh, youth, pat I mean, 40 music majors, and we're all in there, and it's like the best of the best from every church. I mean, you sing, big deal. Everybody sings. You play something, what we do, the janitor plays guitar better than you do, you know? You know, you stay in a small enough bowl, you can be a big fish. 
but I'm Nemo in the ocean today, you know? And the head of the music department comes in and he just scared me to death. This guy just smelled smart, you know? And he starts explaining to us all exactly what we're going to do today. And he, and he said, we're going to take a test. The word test does to me what the blue lights in your rearview mirror do to you, you know? Because I, uh, I don't do tests. I, I, even if I know the answer, I can't figure out how you're asking the question to tell you the right way. Some of you know what I'm saying. And uh, he said, we're going to take a test, guys, and you're going to have two hours to complete this test. And, and we will decide from this where you begin in your major, whether or not you even should major in music at this university. And I sat in the room as they began to pass this test out and and he prayed. And when he said amen, it was like the sound of thunder. The pencils tearing this test to pieces. I'm in the back of the room watching these people. It looked like they were writing in a coloring book. It's like it was nothing for them. And I start looking down at this test and I start reading it. And uh, I didn't know any answers to this test. I didn't know one. And I, I began to wonder, oh, how am I going to get out of here without anybody noticing? And eight minutes in to my two-hour test, I signed my name to my paper and I walked through all of those people and I could just feel them looking up at me. And I walked all the way to the front and I put my test face down in front of Dr. Malone. And I walked out of that room. I didn't think I'd ever see any of them again because I was going home. And I was deciding what I was going to tell my wife and how I was going to word this to my family. And I was walking home. It was a straight shot from, from the building, the music building, to our apartment. But God and His sovereignty, a hundred years before that day, planted this big chapel between me and my house. And the sidewalk just led straight in. And I walked into this building, and I sat down in the back, and I got mad. Because, I mean, you know, when you finally do something for God, isn't the sun supposed to shine? I mean, when you're finally obedient, you finally take the big step. I mean, the birds sing, and little baby angels fall around and, and sing songs to you. I mean, isn't that what's supposed to happen? People start giving you cars and houses and everything because you're obedient now. <laughs> and I sat in this room, and I just started to kind of brew a little bit. And they started getting ready for chapel service, and people started filing in. And the room was full. I'd never seen that many people in a room before. Maybe five or six hundred people. And, and these students got up on the stage and they stepped up to the microphone. And I recognized some of them because they were new like me. And when they started singing, they were awesome. And when that guy started playing the piano, he was unbelievable. And all I could do is sit in the back of that chapel and think, now see God, that is the kind of person you need. You see how good they are? People would listen to them for hours. I didn't hear a word they sang. I didn't hear a word anyone preached. And when that service was over, they all started filing out, and I stayed in the back. And after a while, they turned the lights off, and it was about 10.30 in the morning, and these blue stained glass windows just kind of shined in. I started walking up to the front, and... I came up to the front of the building and there was this piano. Another one of those sovereign God moments. This piano was so big, it was a beast. It was so big they couldn't put it on the stage. They sat it in the floor. Otherwise, I would have never walked up onto a stage. And I went to the piano and I sat down. And I started playing... The only four chords I knew. I used to sit in my church after everybody would leave and play my chords and they sounded so cool, you know? They didn't sound cool anymore. All I could think was, 
man, this doesn't sound anything like that other guy I was playing a while ago. He was, he was awesome. And I sat there at that piano in that empty chapel and I had my first fight with God. And I was like, God, what's the deal? I mean, you know how I get. You know I get fired up sometimes and I always seem to catch myself before I do something really dumb. But I'm in Florida. I have left the state. I got married. I've drugged my wife down here. She, she's working her first day of work to pay for this. My church gives me this big send-off service and they all come by to shake my hand because Mark is going to go do this great thing for God. My parents are probably still on the phone calling all the relatives to talk about how proud they are and I am about to come home because I am not good enough for this. God started teaching me a lesson that day. A lesson that He's still teaching me. And I think it's the reason there even is a casting crowns. That morning, He started to say to me, Mark, I don't need you. I want you. Mark, I don't need you. I want you. Do you think that all of these fears and limitations and all these things that make you feel so small are worrying me? Do you think that all these little initials that you got from all these little tests when you were a kid are weighing me down? Mark, I am going to do something in the world. I just want to know if you want to come. Well, I went back to school the next day. And I went back the next day and the next day. And six years later, I graduated four-year college. Algebra was my favorite class. I took it three times. The teacher and I are really close after a while, you know. She still calls. And now I'm a youth pastor for about 400 teenagers and I have no idea what I'm doing. I sit in my office sometime and I'm thinking, well, this is it. We're going down today. There's some committee somewhere in the church right now and they're having a meeting. <laughs> And they're going to walk into my office and they're going to say, brother, and you know it's bad when they say brother. Yeah. Brother, we've been talking and we're really not sure what you're doing. We don't think you know either. And it's on those days that God has to remind me, and I have them a lot. Mark, if I'd have wanted somebody else, I'd have called somebody else. You get up there, dyslexic boy. You show the world what I'll do through somebody that will let me. And I have spent 13 years, listen to me, I've spent 13 years saying things I'm not sharp enough to say. I write songs I'm not good enough to write. I'm a part of things constantly that are so above me. I am swimming in the deep end. Because God doesn't need me. Me. This song started at that great big piano and that great big chapel with the only four chords that I knew. I 